Hey, everybody. Welcome to uh, Breakfast All Day. Alonzo here with Matt and Christy. Uh, just after its premiere at the Toronto Film Festival, we get the Netflix debut of uh, The Starling, starring uh, Melissa McCarthy. And if uh, Nine Perfect Strangers wasn't enough to really make you question your fandom, this might be. Christy, what's it about? Yikes. So Melissa McCarthy and Chris O'Dowd are a married couple. And at the very beginning of the film, we see that they have an infant daughter and they're decorating her room. And then tragedy strikes and they lose her. And it's about how they deal with their grief and how they move on or don't in different ways. Um, She is trying to still you know, go back to work and live life as normally as she can. Um, He suffered a breakdown and is being treated at a mental health facility, which is a really nice place, by the way. It looks like a winery in Ojai or something. It's really, (laughs) I kept thinking like she works at a grocery store and he is a grade school art teacher. And how can they afford to have him stay for as long as he stays in this really, really plush? They must have really great insurance. It's a really nice place. It looks like I mean, a spa. Whatever union those grocery workers are in must have <laughs> terrific yeah. insurance. So she's so he is there and, and she drives an hour each way to see him once a week and, and they're struggling to reconnect through therapy. And um, the the therapist that they're working with, who is um, the wife of the director. Her name is Kim Quinn. She's married to director Theodore Melfi, mm-hmm. who also did Hidden Figures. And St. Vincent. Among many other films. And also St. Vincent with Melissa McCarthy. Um, she recommends a, a guy from Melissa McCarthy to go see, to get through the obstacles she's dealing with as far as healing and connecting with her husband. And he's played by Kevin Klein. He's actually a veterinarian, but he's a former therapist. They begin having these on and off again, kind of de facto therapy sessions. But back at home, she's trying to clean up the garden. And when she does, this like kamikaze starling keeps like zooming past her and like hitting her in the head and knocking her down. It's very territorial and metaphorical and symbolic, not very subtle. The CGI starling represents so much that everybody here has to deal with. And um, It's just got this incredibly awkward and like whiplash inducing swing from like comedy to drama. And it's incredibly mawkish and, um, and rushed emotionally and no moment ever rings true. And they keep going back to this incredibly heavy handed metaphor of the starling and what it represents in, in their lives. And I was just cringing for quite a bit of this film. There's like eight metaphors in this movie. And I think I've made the joke before where it's like jewelry. You should look in the mirror and take one item (laughs) off before you leave the house. Like a proper Southern woman would. Yes, because the the starling is a metaphor. The garden is a metaphor. The hostess snowballs are a metaphor. Like they just movie lays them on. This this was was a blacklist screenplay, by the way. And I don't pay a lot of attention to the blacklist, except I know that Almost every time I've ever reviewed a movie where they're like, oh, it's from a Blacklist screenplay, it's terribly written. (laughs) So I don't know if that speaks for all of the Blacklist movies or just the ones that finally get produced, but like there's a, I'm I'm noticing a trend here. Yeah, you're right. This movie is completely phony baloney. Um, You know, like the first time that she has a real conversation with Kevin Klein, he just lays out everything that she is feeling and thinking and needs to know. And it's just like, oh, well, we got there fast. Uh, And then, yeah, it it is dealing with this genuinely tragic, you know, circumstance and this like, you know, awful, awful thing for this couple to try and, you know, endure and and move past and, and get to their life afterwards. Uh, and it, it it's all handled so glibly and artificially. And, you know, I, I was kidding before. I, I am a, a Melissa McCarthy fan, but man, the sometimes she just whiffs the choices of material. And this is one of those times where it's like, what were you thinking? Because it it, it is so completely fake. Like Melfi, I did like Hidden Figures, but mm-hmm. this reminded me of what I hated about St. Vincent, which is the the complete insincerity and and t- total like 
these characters who I just don't buy for a second. It's also this criminal waste of David Diggs and Timothy Oliphant. Yeah. Holy shit. These and guys. Skylar Gisondo. Even. Skylar Gisondo. <laughs> but David Diggs has like two lines. He's like the art teacher at the therapy at the, the mental hospital where yeah. Chris O'Dowd is, is staying and says like the perfect thing to him to like unlock what's wrong. <laughs> And like Timothy Oliphant is like Melissa McCarthy's boss at the grocery store. And, he, and he's like annoyed that she's distracted. Like they get yeah. nothing to play. Yeah. Yeah. This movie is not good. Um, <laughs> I, I thought it was a bad sign. Like right off the bat, you know, you see this, this CGI bird flying yeah. around and it's not particularly good CGI. No. Like Bubo the owl looked better in the original Clash of the Titans than this bird does. <laughs> uh, that was practical. I, <laughs> Right. Um, yeah. I, you know, there's a good cast here. I think Kevin Klein is, I mean, he, he turns in the best he can with the material that he's given. And I, oh, everybody is heavy right. fireman's carrying this thing as much. Yeah. As <laughs> um, but it also like picks up things that it then never pays off. Like there's this whole thing that like, Oh, maybe somebody's not actually taking their medication and there's, and then there turns out there's piles of it. And I thought, oh, okay, well, then that's going to mean something. Nope. Nope. It never means yeah. anything. Um, there's a lot of stuff that they set up and then never pay off, right? Like, and, you know, we joke about Chekhov's blank on this. This movie is filled with examples of that. that uh -huh. And then it never addresses. Um, yeah, it's and it's frustrating because... You could see a little bit of like, oh, this could be really good with a better script. And it makes me start doubting the blacklist. Like, huh. maybe there's a reason all these scripts haven't been picked up, <laughs> right? Because um, I kept thinking, like, what would this be like in the hands of a better director or a more like somebody who could really give it more? But I don't think the stuff is in, in the script for that. Um, yeah, and I think you know if you're if you're doing a movie where you know, especially with Melissa McCarthy, who absolutely is able to play dr drama. Sure, yeah. Then don't let her do her physical hijinks, right? Like, make her stick to the drama. Let's, you know, do what they did with um, Can you Coolidge in, in Swan Song, right? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't let, her, don't let her fall back on her comfort zone. Like, make her push herself, you know, push her to do something interesting. And there's glimmers of that in here, but... Eh. Yeah, she does I, fall a lot because the bird like dive bombs her head. Yeah, she falls. So she has to keep falling. Room. Yeah, she has to fall off a ladder. How is she and not that, like seriously injured? She falls well, flat on her back from like high up on a ladder. Every time the bird hits her, <laughs> it's like it's like a punch from Rocky. Like it, it sounds like the bird is a three hundred. I mean, it sounds like she's getting slugged. Yeah. Right. Not since Birdemic have you seen <laughs> birds that were able to do this much damage. Right. And they, and they anthropomorphize this bird in so mm. egregiously, so cloyingly. It is so obnoxious what this bird can do. What, uh, what it really is doing, what's yeah. really happening with the bird, first of all. Yeah. yeah. It's meant to make us go, oh. I'm on the bird side. <laughs> so team Starling. All right. And at the core of this is, you know, a, a tragic story yes. that they want us to get weepy about, but also they treat in a very detached way that lacks any kind of substance or insight. Yeah. Yeah. It, like yeah. What, what happens to this family? It could have been any number of awful things. Right. And, and it's not, there's no, grounding to the way it deals with that grief and the way a couple has to work through that grief or does you know chooses to work together or not uh -huh. based on that grief like there are a little bit of acknowledgement of it but it's more telling us than than showing yeah. us and that's really obnoxious that's what telling us in the music because there's all these original songs oh from like God, Brandy songs. Carlisle and Mumford and Sons, and it's all super like on the nose, spelling out what's happening on screen, and yeah, it's Dave all like folk Dave rock. Walked, Dave walked through the room. He's like, they had money for songs <laughs> because these are like. I said yes, but all of the songs are like telling you everything that the movie wants you to be feeling and underscores what the movie should be showing, and it, like yeah, good songs used terribly, and they're all essentially versions of the same song, kind of. Right. They're all kind of like, like, like not twee, but like all folk rock kind of like all the same tonally and saying the same kind of thing. And 
just with yeah, it's the sort voices. of thing, it's the sort of thing where like if you get Iron and Wine to do your score, all the songs are going to sound like that. And yeah. here you've got four different people that are all doing that kind of like. <laughs> you know, sort of, so yeah. Anyway, yeah. it's not good. It's uh, it's on Netflix though. It's it a three from me. Give it a four. Uh, you know, just there are like. I admire that Klein and O'Dowd particularly are really trying to imbue these nothing characters with something, but they can only do so much. Yeah, I'm there with you. I give it a four. Okay, our number is 3.7. The Starling is swooping into your Netflix now. Have at it. Uh, all right, well, thanks for watching, everybody. Like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us at BeFast All Day on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash BeFast All Day. A lot of amazing stuff going on over there. First of all, if you like watching these reviews, but you don't want any of those pesky commercial interruptions, that's where we got them at the Patreon page. You can enjoy them commercial free. You can also check out exclusive content like our TV recaps. We're currently talking about Ted Lasso and the morning show. And uh, our subscribers have chosen as they do every month, a classic for us to review. And so we'll be talking about Wes Anderson's Rushmore as part of our back to school September. Uh, so yeah, that and lots more. So go visit our Patreon page. If you aren't already a member, patreon.com slash be all day. Have a great week, everybody. Take care of yourselves and each other. And we'll see you next time.